Steve, Sean, welcome to Puerto Rico. It's good to see you guys. Thank you, Thank you for the invitation. Absolutely. So this will be the first time we're doing this. We've got pest control royalty, Sean Hollis, <laughs> president of Wayne's in the Deep South. And of course, we've got another Southerner here, Steve Moat, a portfolio of anti-CMAX and the owner of its acquisition target. First time we've done this. Sean, let's start with you a little bit. Yeah. So you, you run the Wayne's platform for anti-CMAX yeah. in Alabama. Let's talk a little bit about Wayne's and let's talk about when you got your start. Yeah, so so Wayne's is a 50 year old company next year. Uh, and uh, and we're, we are Birmingham based uh, operations, but we have operations in Tennessee, Mississippi, and in the Panhandle of Florida. Okay. And so we were acquired by anti-CMAX in 2019 uh, and I was, uh, I was in an operations role at that point, uh, running r really our lawn care and landscaping business. Mm -hmm. Uh, we diverged on the landscaping side when we, when Ancimex acquired us. And so I moved into an operations role for, we call it our Northern hemisphere. So Tennessee. Yep. So the, the Knoxville, Nashville, Huntsville, uh, operations. Uh, and Eric Fry was one of our owners and, and he, uh, stayed around as president for 18 months. Okay. And. Uh, so the plan was for me all along to transition into the president's role. And so I, I did that uh, now about 22 or 23 months ago. So uh, just been uh, just phenomenal growth since uh, since the, the Antisemex acquisition for us and, uh, and and our entire leadership team. So we had a very robust leadership team. We've been able to stay together as a group, a, a family. Most of us have been there 12, 13, 15 years. Mm. And uh, and we've we've. We've had a lot of fun growing and, and watching uh, other opportunities for some of our other uh, teammates to, to take on leadership roles. And so it's just been a uh, real, real phenomenal um, opportunity. How big is Wayne's now? So, uh, so from a revenue standpoint, uh, this year we'll finish at around 72 million, okay. uh, planning for a, a performance standpoint of 90 million next year. So. So you're one of the biggest North American platforms mm -hmm. for anti -X. I think we're probably number two, number three, depending on if you're talking to Paul or Bill, who you're talking to, but yeah. Mm -hmm. And you and Steve just consummated a transaction. Mm -hmm. When did this close? What, about a month ago? About a month ago, yeah. September 1, so yeah. So Steve, mm -hmm. you're out of pest control, at least for the next five years. I'm out, and I'm glad I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> so at my age, at 70 years old, um, part of it is my insurance doubled over the last few years, especially this past year. Mm -hmm. But the exposure in the termite world, given my age, I just didn't need that anymore. And, of course, I met Sean about a year and a half ago and really met Eric at the time because he was the president. So as I was running this business for the last four or five years, I decided to sell all my outlining areas. Mm -hmm. So any, we had a little business in Tuscaloosa, Chilton County, and Shelby County. And so I put a book of business that didn't make sense for us to run to Tuscaloosa for one or two accounts. Mm -hmm. What was that book of business was 110000 Yeah. And I cut a deal with Eric at the time. To, to sell that business and really got to know Eric and Sean and got to know that culture where I was impressed with. So we sold that book of business and they did everything that they said they were gonna do, including paying me. <laughs> how, how did you get into pest control? So <clears throat> my business started um, in the 40s with my grandfather. Uh, KK Sparks started the business. Mm -hmm. So after 20 years or so, he passed away. My uncle ran the business. So he ran it for 20 years or so. Mm -hmm. And I have a paper distribution business, or did, and a mm -hmm. partner. This is more than you asked for. But my partner lost his job. And 20 years ago, he came to me and said, okay, I've lost my job. And he ran a corporation of 300 employees. He was the president. And he said, I'm going to come in. And he was my partner. And I'm going to run the business with you. I said, no, you're not going to run this business that I created. You're a silent partner. And I need you to continue to be a silent partner. So as we were looking for a business for him to buy, 
so that he could run his own business. Mm -hmm. We ended up buying the pest control from my uncle and got it back in the family. So, and my mother was elated because that was her father that started it. So this can, you know, that was a third generation business. And so when we got it, Bill Pritchard was running it, but to go from 300 employees to five employees, yep. that's all we had. And at that time, American Pest Control did 200,000 a year. So it was very small. Mm -hmm. This is back in the 80s and 90s. So we bought the business. Uh, Bill Pritchard ran it. It didn't fit for him. And after we figured out that he couldn't run it because it just didn't fit, I brought it into the, my paper distribution and we ran it for 10 or 15 years and built it up through acquisition. And over the, the last 20 years, we built it up from 200,000 a month, I mean a year, to 200,000 a month, plus some. Yep. So um, so we, we, we grew organically a little bit, but mainly we just bought a bunch of guys and tucked them in and built it up over time. And at the time that we sold to Wayne's, we had 25 employees and did about 3 million in sales. I remember, Steve, when you first called me some months ago, you were already having some chit chat with, with Wayne's. And we talked about competitive processes and so on and so forth, but you were pretty adamant that all else being equal, you wanted to go with Wayne's. As I got to know Sean and Eric, uh, I really didn't know Sean as much as Eric, but Eric is a very impressive guy, okay. sales guy. So he was my kind of guy, and he convinced me that he was the right guy to sell to. So when I did the deal, it was not a big deal to them or me, but it got me a chance to learn their personality, their culture, mm -hmm. and I wanted to get the most I could for the company. Of course. But I felt like Wayne's was the best fit. And now that the dust is barely settled on the transaction, how are your people dealing with it? You know, <clears throat> my people did not know. I had two people in the organization that knew I'd committed to try to sell the company. Mm -hmm. And by the time we closed the deal after all of the due diligence, which is another story. <laughs> so we, uh, we finally closed the deal and had an announcement and it was a shock. Yeah. I mean, to sit there after 20 years and the family and the culture and the management team, I mean, they didn't want to change anything, but again, at my age and with all the exposure, I sold the deal, told them, I, I told Sean this, I gave everybody a bonus, tiered it up according to how many years they had been there to try to make it right for them. Uh, I bonused out all the management team. And so, so I tried to exit correctly mm -hmm. and shared some of the some of the revenue with them and, mm -hmm. or the funds with them. And so it was a shock, but I think it's turned out Sean's team came in well, he and I have talked about it, the way he handled that. Mm -hmm. He, I had the meeting and we talked about going to dinner the night before and I decided not to do that. Yep. So when I made my announcement on Thursday morning, nobody knew. So we had an audience of 25 people. I kicked off the meeting at seven o'clock. I took about 15 or 20 minutes to try to explain why I did what I did. And then his staff was in the parking lot. And the minute I said, okay, I'm ready, he came in with his team so that they would know who I sold to, get to know Sean. But he brought HR, operations, uh, four or five or six people, including- Try, try not to overwhelm everybody. Yeah. yeah. But, but it was important that as I moved on, that they knew a little bit about Sean and who his staff was, mm -hmm. who the new leadership team was. And what was neat is after we spent an hour or so there getting to know Sean and his staff, he had a bus and took all of my people to his facility saying, here's your new home. Here's your bonus money. We're going to treat you right. Everybody had a job. And I thought it went perfectly as far as the transition goes. And we've learned, you know, so we've learned a lot uh, on day ones and what mm -hmm. that can look like. And and so we're still also new enough to, we call it shock and awe, right? Yep. We're still new enough to that. Uh, our team is that 
that we can say that in those day ones with these new team members that we meet that, hey, we were we were in your seat. We know what that felt like, you know, yep. a couple of three years ago. And so we like to share that. And, and you know, this was an awesome opportunity where Birmingham is our flagship. And, and we did have a, a really nice space for folks to come and, and go have lunch with us and, and, and get acclimated, if you will, to our, to our office. Yep. And so, uh, we've done day ones in a variety of different ways and, and hotel places in their building and our building. And this, this really did work out really well for us to, to, you know, be able to, to treat that team with some respect and get them, get them over to our operations and, and get everybody hired and feed them some lunch and answer mm -hmm. any questions they have because, uh, you know, there's a, that's a, that's a big deal in people's lives. It and, really is uh, a big deal. And so we, we have a frequently asked question list that we give out, you know, cause mom has a bunch of questions when you get home at the kitchen table that night. And we try to anticipate those and get ahead of that. But, uh, but we, we've, uh, now this is our ninth transaction. So, uh, feel like we, we learn, we know we learn a little something every time and, and trying to, trying to make it as, as good as we can for. Well, I, I'll hand it to you, Sean. You know, we've done multiple deals with you now. Mm -hmm. You've done a phenomenal job. I guess my question for you is, you're the president of this platform. What's in it for you to do a deal? Like, why do, you know, you're growing your business organically. Why the heck do you even care about doing an acquisition? Yeah, so, so I mentioned that since uh, since we've been acquired by Anta CMEX that uh, we've had, I've seen our teammates get a great deal of opportunity. So we, we had six branches or six, we call them service centers at the time. And we're up to 12 now. Yep. And so we've been able to fill those internally through Wayne's employees that were service managers. We call them supervisors at the time yep. that are now branch managers. Uh, even some of these acquired team members have, are now running operations for us. Mm -hmm. And so for us to be able to see that is, is awesome. But really, uh, the talent acquisition. So yeah, I'm buying a customer list. I'm buying, you know, the opportunity to go serve some customers and, and do that in a world class manner. But, you know, you can't, you can't do that, uh, without great people. And so when we have the opportunity to, to, to mesh with an, op with an operation like Steve had, I mean, to get that group of folks on our team is, is outstanding, especially in today's climate yeah. when, when hiring folks is tough. That's a huge, huge opportunity for us is to learn new ways to serve customers. Mm -hmm. So we've added fall invader service or carpenter bee service, things we've learned from various operations that we've taken over, a better way to upgrade to Centricon from liquid to Centricon. You know, all the things that we learn as we acquire these companies, we bring into our repertoire and add them to the Wayne's way, which is the Cubs way, our SOPs that we create. And, uh, and that grows every month. So where do you ultimately see Wayne's going from a geographic perspective? I mean, which, What's your white space? Yeah, so our given territory is is the Tennessee, Mississippi, uh, Alabama, and the, and the Panhandle. That's that's Antecimex's kind of territory. We have the largest, from a square mile standpoint, we have the largest territory in, in yep. the U.S. from Antecimex. You guys have probably seen uh, a lot that, that Dan Cathy has said over the years. And one of the things he always said was, uh, you know, you, you'll get the chance to get bigger when you get better. And, and so as you get better, people will demand that you get bigger. And yeah. so what, whatever that means for us, we're, we're willing to take on. So. Tell you one thing that was very interesting. Uh, when I sold that book of business, 110,000 mm -hmm. is Sean and I talked about the retention rate typically was 80% or so. Yeah. 80, 80 to 85. So the earn out, you know, we, we got 50% down The earn out became a year later. And the retention rate was 92. 92%. So it was interesting that they bought a book of business, did not take my people, put his people in, and they still retained 92% of the business, which was very impressive to me that he put the right people and did the right thing to keep that kind of customer base. So when he bought us, shame on him if he can't do 92 plus <laughs> in these years to come. Yep. And I book a business. <laughs> Set the bar high. No huh? pressure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll know now it's 92% or more. Exactly. <laughs> but that was in Mississippi. No. What, where no. was that book of business? No, that was uh, Chilton County, which is Clanton, Alabama mm. and Tuscaloosa. So through, I bought seven or eight companies and through all those acquisitions, we end up little pieces of business that just didn't make sense. Yeah. And he was in those locations. Mm -hmm. So he just tucked it in and kept going. So worked out well. Down in Alabama, you guys have clearly been beneficiaries of a 
there's a demographic shift, right? You got Alabama is a net importer of people, and so when I think about Alabama versus other markets, I mean it's it's actually been growing above the southeast trend line. Where do you two see that continuing to go here in the future? I guess Huntsville is a yeah, so, shining example. Yeah, so Huntsville, Alabama is in the, the north kind of east corner mm-hmm. and uh, was just named the best place to live in America. And it's yeah. growing by leaps and bounds. So NASA's there, FBI, too, is moving out on the base there. So they're going to have their second headquarters there. But Toyota and Mazda just built a plant there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's, it's going to be the, well, it already is to some extent, but it's heading even more towards being the Silicon Valley of the South. And so kind of taking that away from the Triangle area. And uh, and so Huntsville, we see as a gigantic opportunity for us. But Birmingham's got unlimited growth potential. And then, you know, really between Madison County, which is the Huntsville, and Baldwin County, which is outskirts of Mobile, the, mm-hmm. the other side of the bay, mm-hmm. they compete annually for fastest growing counties. And we're in both. And so we do... Last in the LTM, we've done thirteen thousand seven hundred forty nine pre treats. Only know that number because I'm in planning right now. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, but the vast majority of those have come in those two counties for us and Nashville, obviously. So. Alabama is a difficult geography to operate in regarding termite, right? I mean, we all hear about the termite issues. What's the reality on the ground with regard to doing termite treatments in Alabama? You know, uh, so so for us, we learned because we've had Gulf Coast operations for a while, uh, and we learned a long time ago that that the bait systems uh, are by far and away the better uh, better protection system for the customer. And uh, you know, I came into Wayne's from from the golf course business. I did. I, my story is I went and known a termite that bit me in the toe, and um, and but I learned pretty quickly because I had to answer for damage claims yep. to our owner at the point. And so we had liquid accounts, we had Centricon accounts. And so I remember the year that I realized that out of my 26 damage claims, two of them were Centricon. Mm-hmm. That's, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that's a better way to go. And so we moved our entire uh, client base over to that about five years ago. And then as we acquire these companies, we see that as an opportunity, the liquid upgrade for us uh, to, to offer an upgrade for the customer, but also from a revenue standpoint for us is a, is a win. So. So you, you go out and you do these acquisitions. So this was a nice little add-on acquisition for your business. The transaction closes. You want to retain the people. How does customer retention work post-closing? What are the important things that you guys do? Yeah, so Steve and I write a letter together that really our marketing folks write for us that we that we get out to the, the customer base. That announces. Not even day one. Yeah, no. So either. he bought us out, mm-hmm. closed 30 days ago or so. Yep. And after we transition... The people, I guess even maybe the software, is the letter goes out like just now. Yep, yep. So what does so, it say? So we just we just announced the, the acquisition. We ensure the customer that they're going to continue to deliver the, we're going to continue to deliver the same level of service that Steve. Same price. Yep, yep. Kind of hold true to, to their pricing schedule. And, uh, and then make sure that they understand that we're going to offer, you know, uh, other, other things that Steve didn't have. So lawn care or or you know, maybe a more robust mosquito program and some different mm-hmm. op- opportunities that they may have for, for other service opportunities. You know, Steve had already started upgrading his liquid customers to Centricon, so there wasn't a great deal of portfolio left to, to do that, but we've, we've had some success already with that. And so, uh, but, you know, I think it, it's, it starts though with his, his folks that have gotten comfortable with us. Mm-hmm. And so the reason we wait about a month or a month and a half is we, at the point we move them into our software and the the bill looks different, you know, yep. you kind of need to let them know, right? But by then we, and we tell guys day one, don't back away. So if somebody heard about it somehow, it's not like pest control is on the tip of everybody's tongue, but if they heard that Steve had sold, answer, yeah, sure. And it's going to yeah. be a good thing. And so, uh, but we give them, we give them the opportunity to, to help break that ice, if you will, with their customers and, mm-hmm. And so far, it's been it's been a good a, a, a good win for us. I think it was perfect that after the announcement on that Thursday morning, we took off that day. Yep. You know, but on Friday, all the same trucks, the same people, the same software, the same process took place for the next week or two, until he kicked in eventually with his own platform. So, I mean, our customers didn't see any different day one until some of them didn't even know until we got the letter. Yeah, yeah. 
You know. And so that's a that's a big question on day one from the guys, right? Is what what's tomorrow look like? Well, it looks like yesterday. So you yeah, go serve right. your customers just like you were doing yesterday. And so and and we we do try to ease them into it so that then we can ease our customer base, their their customer base into it, right? What about the brand? So we roll the brand because it just makes sense. We we drive shiny yellow trucks, that's our deal, right? And uh and so we'll move that over uh, you know, over a six month period. So mm -hmm. obviously I have to it takes time to swap out trucks or do whatever you do there. But so the guys are actually meeting this morning. It's, it's funny. The guys are meeting in our service center this morning with, yep. with both field teams and uh, they're getting their new uniforms. They're getting their new Wayne's uniforms. So they'll show up at the doors tomorrow with a Wayne's uniform, still driving an American pest control truck. But that starts to, that starts the transition. Yes, exactly. That starts the question. Right. Hey, that's a different uniform. Hey, tell me about that. And, and we've learned that that conversation is best handled by his folks with his customers and then passed over to us when we integrate the routes. Right. So, yeah, I think it's a perfect plan. I think what you just said and what you're doing is exactly what I would do. Mm -hmm. So it's perfect. What what sort of participation do you have now in this whole thing, Steve? Zero. Uh, he has to pick up the phone when I call him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So my deal For three is, months, he's got to pick up the phone. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm here. Uh, uh, Jeff Phillips, who ran our business, is very close to somewhere those people that work for you now. So there's a lot of contact between Jeff and the old staff and Allison and his, her, your staff. But I was really the owner, but I was not in it from day to day. So I participated, but I was arm's length with most of those people. You know, again, I've only been on site for four or five years mm -hmm. since I sold my other paper distribution. Yeah. So, so all these people, I remember when I came on board because Larry passed away, Jeff sat down with me and said, now, do I need to worry about my job? And I said, no, you just need to keep on keeping on and we'll figure this out together. So, yeah. yeah so it worked out well. Have you gotten any distress calls from employees? Jeff has. <laughs> so, but Jeff has done a great job coaching them up, trying to make sure that they give Wayne's a chance to perform and treat them right. But I think the benefits are better. Mm -hmm. And so the pay was as good or better. Yep. So I think everything is in place for them to transition. It's just awkward to change jobs, to yeah. change leadership, to change physical locations. But I think most of them are, are going to be fine. It's just going to take time. I mean, changing jobs is a big deal. Changing cultures is a big deal. Yeah. So when I think about your team, your technicians, your managers, you know, realistically, what sort of opportunities exist for them now versus what existed under you? Yeah. So we were a small mom and pop business. I mean, you know, with three million in sales, we did have a 401k. We did have some benefits, but our benefit package was not near as good as what yours is. And given the size and opportunity and other things that you sell, mm -hmm. my guys have an opportunity to shine. Yep. And so as we went through the 22 employees and profiled each employee, we shared with him two or three or four people that are outstanding employees and put an asterisk by their name and said, make sure when you sit down with these guys that you keep these four or five key people. And I don't care what you got to do to make them feel better, mm -hmm. pay them more, but you need to take care of these people because they're the glue to the whole company. So he'll find that out. I'm sure you got special people that go beyond the call of duty. And so I think given what I know about Sean and Wayne's, these guys are going to be in a better place. It's just going to take time. What are some of the biggest things that you learned during the transaction? I know Diligence was super fun for you, but that's standard on every deal. <laughs> Is it? Every deal. Yeah. Yeah. My office manager had to take care of her job. And then the due diligence on top of everything, we had to do it secretly. Mm -hmm. So we were having, she was having to work nights and weekends to go pull data, pull files. But Allison did a great job getting through that. Is Potomac did a good job. They had a report card. What do you... What do you call your um, CMI? SIM, the Confidential Information Memo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and we'd get a report card. So yep. every day, you know, we would say, 
you know, you're at 60%, you're at 65%. The minute she thought she reached 70%, you'd load on a few more questions. It'd fall from 70 to 50. We can't give you that good of a grade, Steve. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought that, that the system and the process and what you guys put together was very beneficial. It's kind of like what Sean said is when I cut a deal with Potomac, and I guess we'll talk about that, I cut the best deal I could without you. And then I told them about you and the relationship that you and I talked about having. And he says, well, I trust Paul and we can't verify your numbers without Paul's help. And then I introduced you to the Mexican. To the Mexican, yes. So so tell us about your first phone call with the Mexican, Steve. How'd that work out? Did you understand what he said? No, I did not understand. I still don't understand half of what, because <laughs> Michelle and I talk about this. I said, uh, we met uh, Franco's brother and half of the stories, because they're full of stories, mm. I would look at her. Full of something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he, is a, he is a very colorful, unique, dynamic, <laughs> So, but we love him. I love being around him. Um, he is one intense. Everything that I ask him to do, just like he said, I'll be on every call. Everything Franco said that he would do, he did. And he is the most attentive guy I've ever been around. If I text Gee, him- his girlfriend doesn't say that, but- <laughs> <laughs> he, She doesn't? No. Okay. Well, he is very, he is super driven and Super detailed, and is he listening? I'm sure he'll be like, I don't know that he's listening now. <laughs> where is Franco? <laughs> I don't know where he is. So, but no, Franco did a great job, and uh, he is hard to understand, but mm. he's funny and smart, and uh, I'd do it again. Just to hang out with him? Yeah. You going to go on his boat tomorrow? I am. You really are? Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll talk about this afterwards. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so. Sean, we're going to talk a little bit later today yeah. with Sebastian, and we're going to get into some of the discussions about Sebastian's role at uh, Corp Dev versus you know, the business case that you guys have to put together. But I want to talk while Steve's here. Yeah. Now, when you size up an acquisition, so as Steve, Steve said, you guys had a chat. You guys were kind of walking down the path. You would put an offer out on the business. Ultimately, Steve brought us in. But as you're going through and assessing these businesses, what sort of calculus are you doing? What are you thinking about um, with regard to Wayne's and an acquisition target? And it could be Steve's business or any business that you guys acquire. Yeah. What's, what are you looking at? Yeah, so it, 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 it varies, if I'm honest, greatly depending on the market within my market that I'm looking. So obviously with Steve's business being right in Birmingham, right in our flagship area, and, mm -hmm. and really his customer base really just kind of overlaying with where we were mm -hmm. uh, around town there, uh, obviously, that makes a big deal for us from a dollars per mile driven standpoint, yep. or you know, routing and scheduling, yep. and how we can improve there. Um, but then you have to look at, you know, how has that business historically, and where are they sitting from a pricing standpoint? So, so where do they sit? What's their renewal fees? What are they charging for quarterly pest control? And how's that going to fold into my business? What does their service structure look like? Are they even doing quarterly or triannual pest control? Are they still doing monthly or bi monthly? And so I've had the opportunity to kind of coach some guys on here's how you can make your business better uh, and, and, and make your business more attractive even for me. But, you know, then if I look at a white space opportunity that that I have to understand how can that business support a branch manager, right? So if right. I'm going to go step into Memphis, it's a different look than than one that's in Birmingham where it truly is a bolt on in it and it just kind of folds under a current branch that we have. So. It varies wildly, if I'm if I'm honest, depending on what our objective is with that opportunity yep. and, and where we're headed. So. Now, the larger companies like NTCMX tend to have higher pricing than smaller businesses. Yep. How was Americans pricing versus yours? You know, so they were uh, relatively in line with what we see across our market. And look, if I'm honest, uh, we've we've worked hard to improve our pricing structure as we've uh, been acquired by NTCMX. So, yep. you know, I would say. Uh, you know, by and large, across the southeastern United States, excluding Florida, you know, we we don't see the same pricing structures you may see in the Northeast or even in the Midwest. But but we're starting to learn from that as a as an CMX platform now. And ben, we were very courageous this year with a with a price increase. We saw inflation coming right mm -hmm. and needed to try to get ahead of that and, and outpace that if we could. And so our customers, I, I believe, 2022 was the ideal time to to do a price increase on January one because. 
inflation hadn't really hit the pocketbook yet, but everybody knew it was coming. And yep. you got the, oh, yeah, I know why they have to go up. I know yep. why. You know, so what does 2023 look like? Well, that's a TBD, but obviously we have to make some adjustments there. What was your well. price increase in 22? 15%. Yeah, for did, pest and lawn. So. We did 8%. We're not as confident and strong and big. I didn't say I was confident. I just said, yeah, well, (laughs) he closed his eyes, crossed his fingers when he did it. We're a little more cautious and we did 8%. And, um, and we didn't kick it off until April because our management team felt like we wanted to wait until the bug season. Yeah. Until it got a little warmer. Yeah. And not announce it on January 1. So just different philosophy and, we knew we had to have a price increase. Fuel cost was up 40% yeah, that's ridiculous. for us. So you guys did a January 1 across the board, every customer? So everybody that had been a customer for a year or more. So that didn't take into the acquisitions the, the year yeah. prior or the new sales the year prior. But if gotcha. you've been a customer as a pest in line for, for a year or more, we announced that. And look, we, we do monthly billing through billing a credit card. So it's, it's a couple of dollars a month. So it wasn't that big a deal. And so we didn't. Our letter didn't say it's a 15% price increase. We just said your new rate will move to here and it's less than dinner's gonna cost tonight and they were good with it, right? So. What was the fallout on that though? You know, so we've retained right at 92.91% of that customer base that we increased. There again, I only know that number cause I'm in planning, but there's about $1.9 million worth of, of, of additional revenue that we gained and I'm, I've held on to almost 1.8 of it, so. Wow, that's impressive. And it's likely that inflation will be sticky, right? So we're probably going to see high single digits inflation next year. Yep. If that's the case in January 1, you'll hit it again? 8%. It's the plan right now. 15% would be tough again on that same customer base, obviously. But it's a larger base now. So, so my 2021 acquisitions, which were fairly substantial, will roll into this. So it's actually a, a realized two point. Six, I think 2.6 is what I'll realize mm-hmm. 100% of it. So, and what about your cost structure, Sean? You've got higher fuel costs, it's yep. more difficult to get vehicles. Yeah, I mean, are you feeling like that 15% price increase was able to offset the other margin impacts you're having from input yeah. costs? So, so you know, we obviously try to measure the CPI, LCI index if we mm-hmm. can and try yep. to understand what that looks like and and you know, try to quantify that, put a dollar amount to that, and so. Typically each year, if you can, if your price increase can outpace that margin, then, then you, you know, you keep at least keeping your head above water. And we felt like we, that we, we made some progress there this year from a volume standpoint. And, and, uh, and so next year's plan, if, if my wet thumb is pretty good on, on what inflation looks like, we're going to outpace again. But that's really the goal with that is not to, not to gouge the customer, not to go try to, you know, make more money than, or charge more than, than you have to, but you, it's so not a nonprofit organization, right? So we have to stay uh, have to stay above water. So. What about in twenty twenty one? What would you do? So very low, about five percent, uh, and it was it was more graduated. So it was kind of based on either anniversary date or with lawn care. We did it. We were scared of lawn care sales season, so mm-hmm. we kind of waited till we got past that. We didn't we didn't fight our competitors, but uh, we kind of <laughs> were more resolute in twenty twenty two with what, what we. We're doing, and, and again, it worked. I mean, it was kind of. I felt like that three month, that Q one period was the ideal time to do yep. that. So, and historically, had you always done kind of early in the year a price increase? Is that like an, an annual ritual? Yeah. So, uh, if I go back my twelve years at Wayne's, it's been spotty, and it's mostly been in the two to three percent range, yep. and it's been, you know, kind of at springtime or past pest season or before pest season before you before the sales season starts so never never across the board on january 1 and and it worked out relatively well for us when you think about the acquisition of american you know what are really your value creation levers uh, i would imagine given that it's near the flagship you've got route density yep, from routing sure, things what are, what are some other aspects of the deal? you know so steve's business and his customers were were in some of the more affluent areas of birmingham too so my opportunity to cross sell lawn care which is that customer base upsell to to more of his customer base the mosquito program uh, we see that as a, as a as a big offering and then you know like i said we want to we want to continue the trend he didn't he didn't lack but what six or 800 customers, I think, converting his old liquid to Centricon, but we're gonna follow through with that and have a, an initiative to be done with that by the end of Q1. So 
those are always kind of the opportunities that we look at. So what are our, what are our route density opportunities there? What can we gain? And, and not with a goal of headcount reduction, but with, yep. uh, with a way that we can diversify and make a, a revenue enhancement. Exactly. And then, and then what can we do from uh, our other offerings that we have, service offerings that we have, and, and how, do, how do we think we can you know, parlay that to their, that customer base? And then, you know, we always try to, we try to always kind of think about uh, other opportunities. So, you know, one of our, uh, I was just emailing with one of our young guys this morning that came on last year with, with an acquisition in Nashville, and he's got experience as a trainer at Nissan, and he was doing some of that work with this acquisition. And, and so we're having to scale our business as we've grown, as we've tripled over, mm-hmm. over three years. And so our QC world needs some, some help. So I'm going to put him in touch with our, our technical director there and make sure that, that those guys get opportunities. So that's how you, you keep from doing the, the strict headcount reduction. I told our guys that, that sold, Eric and Steven, yeah, I'll jump into this role, but if it ever turns into handing out pink slips day one, I don't want it. And so that that's not what we're going to be about. You know, if I think back to some other recent transactions we did, we did Preventive yep. in Chris Eby's business, yep. Home Shield. Those were largely recurring general press businesses. How successful have you guys been in cross-selling services to those customer bases? You know, so I think from a penetration standpoint on Eby's business, because it's been with us longer, we're at about the 20% mark on lawn care in Nashville, which is really? pretty good for us. Wow. I mean, that's really good. That's that approaching our welcome visit or our new construction process that yep. we follow. So we feel really good about that. And that's been yep. done. Um, you know, it's been, we set up appointments over the phone. Lawn care, you, you really need to put eyeballs on it. It's a tough one to sell over the phone. But when we're there, we can cr- have opportunities to cross sell tree shrub or fire ant or mm-hmm. some other opportunities that we have. So. Do you guys bundle from a price? Oh, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. More you buy, more you save, Paul. So I'm a salesman too. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, when I when I think about you know the acquisition process, I know you started down the path, Wayne's. And then of course we wanted to make sure we got price discovery. Right, so we went out and we had discussions with various different acquirers. I'm interested, and I've never asked you this question, but what was it like talking to other acquirers versus Wayne's? What sort of impression did you get from some of these other guys? Well, the little bit I did of that, I was already biased because I had met Eric and Eric Fry. Do do you know Eric? I do. Okay, very impressive guy, and it's just he's a tough act to follow. So once I met Eric and was sold on him and then cut the deal with Eric. Then once I got to know him and know Sean and knowing that everything they said, you know, came to fruition, you know, I was sold. It was hard for me to open up to anybody else because I knew where I was going. Because part of it is I was interested to make sure that my people would stay and be treated right and Sean and Eric fit that bill perfectly. So um, I, I really didn't give anybody else a chance. I mean, between us, I would have given them last look in the deal anyway. But nobody even came close to to uh, offering what this offer was. So it ended up being the best deal with the best company, with the best opportunity for my people. So maybe we'll have to do the post mortem I mean, and you're out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you how this really went down. So Steve's beat me up for his earnout on the route purchase, right? Yep. So I said, "Well, look, we're going to go to lunch, and I'll deliver. The, I'll hand deliver that check because I wanted to set up the, the acquisition for the next. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. And sure. uh, and and look, we we had a great time at that lunch. Had a great discussion about our retention. Had a great discussion about where we were headed, opportunities for his teammates and and his employees, and where that could where that could land. But uh, but look, it's. Uh, you know, I appreciate Steve's uh, hard work through th- working with us and then working through you guys, and and uh, and it's it's um, it proved to be, a, I think, a good a good partnership. I, you know, I I've, I've been in business for I'm older than you guys, so even on the paper distribution, I've been through ten acquisitions, buying out mom and pops in the paper world. So even on the pest control, we had bought out seven or eight companies over the last twenty years. So I'm used to acquisitions. I'm used to cultures and there's nobody, you know, that would fit better after meeting Wayne and Eric for what I was trying to do. So, I mean, I can give you many examples of other acquisitions I've gone through 
where I said, I would never want to work for that guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, and that wasn't the case with these guys. These are exactly who I wanted my people to be with. So, and I've been around way too long to know what's right and what's not right. So it's worked out good for everybody. Great. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you guys coming down to PR and I look forward to our future discussions here while you're here. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. It's been good.